um, how we would um, how we would describe the indications for enhanced barrier precautions and just the types of words that would be used. Um, right now, as you know, there's the two criteria are the MDRO focused criteria, which is a resident who has a targeted MDRO, and uh, and then secondarily a risk based criterion, which is a patient or a resident who has a wound or a device. And uh, as it currently is written, um, we have the words may be indicated for those two criteria. And so um, it is something that I am conscious of that the words mean a lot. And, and right now, the way the words are listed in the table um, are somewhat divergent from what's, at least from my understanding, what's di it's divergent from what's in the CDC webpage. Uh, because um, the CDC webpage, as I understand it for enhanced barrier precautions, does have the maybe indicated for one section of it, but also in the table has a more declarative is indicated for these two um, criteria. So I do want to have a chance to talk about this as a group to, to get your opinions on this and just uh, how to potentially move forward with bringing in people who are um, on the front lines of long-term care and getting feedback. Thank you. And you're, you are correct. So the, the language that was in the table that was shown yesterday is consistent with the language that's in the, um, it's a, a summary section at the beginning of the guidance, which I believe is also consistent with what is in the white paper um, that is on the HICPAC website. Um, but within the guidance itself, we do, we are more concrete in the, um, in our language that we use. And I, I do definitely agree with you that it is very important as concrete as we are able to be with this language because we have 15,000 plus nursing homes across the country who are making decisions about how to approach in this specific situation MDRO prevention, uh, preventing transmission of MDROs across their nursing homes. And in the nursing home setting, this often ties into um, regulations in those settings. And so I do think that as concrete as we are able to be with that um, is probably for the best for those settings. You know, thanks, thanks for clarifying. So I think then the, the main feedback that I'm hearing from, from some people on the front lines is just the idea that from the standpoint of MDR prevention, there may be more than one way to approach MDR prevention. And so um, whether there's enough evidence to choose this particular criteria or pathway versus another is something that's an open question right now. So I think that's, I think the genesis of some of the discussion about, well, is the evidence there enough to make it concrete and say you, you must do it from a regulatory standpoint versus potentially saying that it's a, in a menu of options. I think that's where we're struggling a little bit with. Yeah, and, and I would completely agree with you that there is not just one way to prevent MDRO transmission. And I don't think that with enhanced barrier precautions that prevents any other methods. And in fact, the really the goal behind the goal really with, with enhanced barrier precautions is that this, this is used in addition to other infection prevention precautions. So what is currently in existence in terms of our hand hygiene and our standard precautions and environmental cleaning and disinfection and so on and so forth, but also any additional infection prevention strategies that we have coming in the future. Thanks. I think um, I do want to just open it up to discussion from the, the larger group, but I think that sets the stage in context a little bit. Thank you. I think I'll just uh, ask to see if there are any comments from the membership or from Go ahead. So I just want to make sure I, I got the end result of that. Is it, it is recommended as one of the prevention strategies or it is you know, expectation that this is implemented baseline. So ultimately, I think the, the expect, 
expectation or what exactly is said with EVP will depend on what, what this group decides. I will say from the current guidance that CDC has on our website, we have put this out there and we do want facilities to use this approach. What I was trying to clarify was that I don't think in using EVP, that means that other precautions can't be used. Um, so for example, other strategies that are, that are coming right now down the road, does not using EVP doesn't mean that other strategies couldn't be used in addition. It's not one way to prevent the transmission of MDROs. But a slightly finer point out of Kara. Um, so there's the you, it's okay to use other strategies in addition. What about instead of? I so I think the way that our guidance is written now, we would want them to be used in addition to enhance barrier precautions. So the intent right now is that that is sort of the floor, and then you can add things on top of it. Yeah. This is a follow-up then. I just want to understand the um, potential impact of our wording. If we do choose to use more of a conditional or a may statement for enhanced barrier precautions, do you anticipate that that would affect the CDC language on the website and ultimately the, the recommendation that it's an expectation versus something that's an option? I, I do think that how, that how we choose to use that language, like using may, I think we have to be cautious with how that will be interpreted. Um, I think that we have found this in guidance, I think, across the board, not even just specific to EVP, but the more concrete we can be in saying this is what we want you to do versus this is not, I think is helpful. And if we leave room there, um, if we if there's the more room we leave for interpretation, the more unclear it can be, um, which I think can lead to challenges with implement implementation and just a lot of questions about whether or not this is what nursing homes should be doing. Okay, thank you. Eric, can I, can I put you on the spot and ask you a, a quick thought? Um, so when you talk about implementation, I'm struck by the huge difference between trying to implement something in a, in a well-resourced location with you know, IPC experts in abundance versus many of the places where we're asking people to do this. I, I think your point about simplicity and no haziness um, is particularly important when you're dealing with some of those locations. But do you want to say a word? Sure, I can try, and I'm happy to, to answer follow-up questions if there are more questions related to this. But it is, um, I, I think that implementing infection prevention strategies and approaches in nursing homes is a little bit different than we have seen this happen in acute care settings. So even though my focus is on nursing homes and other post-acute and long-term care settings, I worked as an infection preventionist in acute care in the past. So I have seen how, I have seen how things are implemented in different settings. And it definitely, um, there may or may not be as much infection prevention expertise at those settings. And so being as clear as possible, and it's not just being clear, but we then take that and all of our partners and other groups that are representing healthcare professionals across long-term care, take this information, develop education, our health departments as well, and work very closely. It is a very closely with those nursing homes to try to provide that education, provide that training, help them to implement any of these practices that, that we put together. And so it is definitely um, I think it's a lot of a lot of effort that goes into doing that, and we have been doing this over the past few years with enhanced barrier precautions. And I, I think that any additional, you know, future infection prevention interventions that I hope and expect we will we will you know put forward for nursing homes into the future will require this as well. And so there are definitely challenges, um, and it does require a lot of effort. But I do think that I do think that it's worthwhile. We have a couple of hands raised up above. There's Elaine first, followed by Dr. Faki. Unless I got that backwards, in which case, Dr. Faki, I apologize. Yeah, it's fine, whichever. Um, I just wanted to say uh, this is a topical discussion for me. I just had a phone conversation with a colleague of mine 
at the Department of Public Health. And he was telling me how much time they're spending clarifying and interpreting uh, the regulations and requirements in the SNFs uh, and board and care settings. And so I do believe that language is very critical. And I remember when I was in the Air Force writing AFIs, they would say there's a difference between may, should, and will. And you need to be sure which one word you want to use when you're writing a guideline. So this kind of goes back to what Mike was saying at the very beginning. If there's going to, we need to make sure we've got good correlation between the different CDC branches and websites uh, when we put out our recommendations for the enhanced barrier to make sure that we use the same words exactly when we say should, may, or will. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be a problem for our um, organizations as they get surveyed, not with what their care that they're giving. I, I know we're all doing well and doing the best that we can, and they're doing a great job, especially when they don't have the resources that the acute side has. But I think it's we want to make it as easy for them to get through the different types of surveys that they have, because I have learned long-term care has a, has a lot more surveys than I was expecting and learning that in my past years working with the uh, Department of Public Health. So uh, any guidance that we can make simpler and clearer, it was appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I was just gonna say, I, I definitely hear you on that. Um, and I will just share with this group, one of the things that has been brought up is that we have, that we have referred nursing homes and health departments to our CDC guidance for enhanced barrier precautions as well as to the resources that we have and to the HICPAC long-term care work group white paper. But we have had people who of course look at all of the available resources, including the 2007 isolation guidelines. And they have said, wait a second, when we look on here, it says MDROs, standard plus contact, but you're saying this and the two don't match. And so that, that discrepancy kind of in line with what was just shared has been something that has been brought up to us and why I agree it is important to make sure that all of these documents are reflective of what we want nursing homes to do. Dr. Faki. You know, I'm, I'm gonna echo the same thing that Elaine shared and you've, you've shared. Uh, I think the, you know, there, there are a couple of things with nursing homes that are very unique. First of all, their skills are not as much as the, the employed nursing, and with all the respect, I mean, I'm, I love nursing homes. It's just the training is, different from the acute care setting. The other thing is, so for example, for training, you may have one nurse for the whole nursing home, you know, so they get, they get the FTEs that support rather than those that were trained over the years uh, to get the education in healthcare. The other thing, they have a very high turnover rate, uh, you know, and they have very scarce resources. So my, my plea would be, as far as implementation, to have clarity, very simple actions to make, you know, to take as far as the implementation of any processes we have, because it's going to be very hard to have the compliance. Uh, I'm, I'm just rehashing what you shared, I think. Thanks. So if I, I, I don't know if this is helpful or not. I mean, I think um, this is a really tough question. I really, we in our branch really appreciate you all thinking hard about this and helping us think through where to go. I think one of the concerns that we have that I think is obvious, but just stating it for the ob more obvious is if, if we, I think the big concern here is probably the second part of it where we're using on the gloves for people who have lines, et cetera. And I think we all recognize the rationale for why that's currently recommended. So a couple things. One, I think if we make this a May statement, just and this is just to inform your deliberations more than a recommendation one way or the other, is I think what you will find is that people, that is the type of uncertainty that we've heard for the last three and a half years that people don't like, and I think will lead to uh, more confusion potentially. So again, probably reiterating what was just said, you know, one consideration is, you know, when you're having your deliberations, whether there should, if, it, if it's a May, should it be there at all type of thing. Um, and then the, the second thing I think is um, just kind of thinking through the, the way we have intended it and the way we've used it and CARE has done an unbelievable job getting this socialized. And I think we've been amazingly struck by how much traction it's gotten in a fairly short period of time. Um, but, you know, if the decision is that 
that EBP should just be the first thing for MDROs, et cetera, kind of like a, I mean, it's a kind of an evolution of the red box, I guess, over, over time. I, I guess the other thing I would ask for the group is, should we think about, if we take away that big chunk that we think is very important, is that EBP, the way we have structured it, the right answer to address uh, MDROs, you know? So should, there, should we start to take a step back and think, are there uh, more, should we be doing more than just gowns and gloves for high-risk activities? for people with MDROs and nursing homes. Don't, don't know the, the answer, don't know if there's even literature to support it one way or the other, but I do have some concerns if we take away the big group, this whole giant piece of the iceberg of people, and we're using gowns and gloves in a way that, you know, fits into the the, um, the way that care is delivered in nursing home, we uh, potentially are missing an opportunity to use that for the people, use a different intervention for people with an MDRO that might be more effective, if that makes sense. No, thank you for the feedback. I think I do appreciate that. Um, if, if there is a difference in language, it's, it's intentional in the sense that if we use the word may, it's, it's because we're not sure if it's ready for prime time um, because of the evidence presented so far. And I think in reviewing the evidence, it's very compelling. Um, there's a lot, I think, in there that makes sense. Uh, but uh, I think we're struck by still the, the lack of data outside of a clinical trial or a study setting where um, we're not really quite sure how it performs um, outside of a study and whether it is impactful for, say, um, MDROs but gram negatives even. So I think that's where some of the uh, some of the hesitancy is in saying that this is something that's ready and should be mandatory in field nursing facilities. Yeah, totally get that. That totally makes sense, and definitely appreciate the the um, the you know great amount of thought that's going to. I mean, the other approach too, I mean, that you might consider is if there's not enough evidence in the work group's mind for EBP in general or that sort of an approach, you know, uh, should it even be in the guideline at all, right? Um, so, you know, I think there's other ways to think about this. I mean, if contact precautions, obviously, which can't be employed for MDROs in nursing home, we recognize that, you know, is there another way that we do this with implement is that you know contact precautions obviously does have a place for short things, limited things like you said. Is there a way to just use contact precautions as touch, take AVP out of the rack if there's not enough evidence in the general opinion of the group to to recommend it, and then have some type of implementation guidance that would be more around implementing contact precautions in a nursing home. And I I think again just. Thinking about our long-term care work group and the discussions there and the discussions in our isolation precautions work group, I think there's less controversy about the application for MDRO patients to say that this is a, ready, a very resident-centric approach. It's more the question of wounds and devices, and uh, it makes sense theoretically, and it, there's some limited data to support it, but that's the part that I think we're um, deliberating about. I was just going to add that um, I, I definitely appreciate that, and I think I know I've shared with the group, but I think one of the challenges that we see in nursing homes compared to other settings is that we are much less likely to know who has an MDRO. We typically, we know from numerous studies from screening in nursing homes that it can be 50 plus percent of nursing home residents that are colonized with some kind of MDRO. We may not expect that the enhanced barrier precautions approach is applied to all of them. We still may focus on a subset of those MDROs, but without screening, we typically know about just a small handful, less than 5% of them. So it means that if we only focus on the known MDROs, we are definitely, I think our concern is that that approach is probably not as impactful on preventing the transmission of MDROs. Um, but appreciate that this approach is a bit different than how we have used transmission-based precautions previously. Um, it is definitely one that is unique for nursing homes, but I think that it is a different setting. It is a different group of residents or patients. Um, the care is a bit different than in other settings, and so it's important to take those things into account. And then the last thing I would ask the group is if this approach isn't the approach that's used, what approach do we use now? because there are other things that are on the horizon. There are more things that we are learning, but with anything, they can take years to really implement, to educate, to communicate. And so we have a problem now. What can we do now? 
Thank you very much. I just want to see if there are any other comments. This is a little bit tangential, but I think it came up yesterday, which is this is meant only for nursing homes. However, have there been any discussions about other sorts of settings that might be associated with acute care for which it would be applicable and would now be the time to think about including the kind of expanded um, care settings where you might use it? Yeah, our work group did consider the use of enhanced barrier precautions in acute care hospitals, uh, but recognize that there's a lack of data right now in terms of effectiveness of, of that approach and also um, some data that shows that it would affect an extremely large number of patients in a hospital setting with any wounds or devices, particularly the, on the device side. So um, we did include in our table congregate settings that are outside of skilled nursing facilities, and so we do recognize that even in acute care settings, behavioral health locations or units may benefit from something like this too. That's exactly what I was thinking in behavioral health. This could be very helpful. Okay, thanks for the feedback. Okay, thank you. It's really helpful to, to talk about this. We have one hand up from Paul Conway. Uh, just a caution to throw out to folks that as you're having these conversations, I'd also think about how the lack of clarity impacts advocacy organizations alliances for aging and uh, organizations like that that work very closely with nursing facilities and uh, independent advocates uh, for the aging. Um, because every time there's lack of clarity um, in the poor execution on the ground at a facility level, you're talking about the impact on advocacy organizations. And so getting their feedback in the process, I think, is essential for CDC credibility. And I say that as a former Deputy Secretary of Health for the state of Virginia, um, the head nursing homes uh, under my purview and would work with the advocates on issues that were uh, inexact and loose interpretations of uh, guidelines that uh, were not specific enough. So just as a heads up, it might be helpful to inform the discussion with advocates. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Are there any other thoughts or comments on the topic that people would like to share? Mike, Sharon, do you feel like you got what you needed? Yeah, no, thank you. It was helpful for this particular topic. Okay, we're going to take that back to our work group. I'll be interested in hearing what you have to say because mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite sure where we left it. Um, <laughs> it. It sounds like there's a little bit more churn that needs to happen. Yeah, I think I think we recognize that there has to be at least a clear um, guidance one way or the other. So we appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad we were able to take that time. Um, Kara, thank you so much for bending over backwards for us today um, and limping. Um, really appreciate your time. But with that, um, we are now ahead of schedule. Um, so let's do this. Um, why don't we go ahead and break briefly, um, come back at 11, and we will have um, any additional public comments before we wrap up for the day. <laughs>